Right. Let me see if I can up the volume just a bit. Is it, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. So welcome to the Wolfsonian. My name is John Mogul. I'm the Associate Director for Curatorial and Educational Affairs. And thank you very much for coming out for day two of our Art Deco Weekend Lecture Series, which we are delighted to present in collaboration and cooperation with the Miami Design Preservation League. Uh, apologies to those of you who may not be able to find a chair. Um, our speaker this morning is obviously a big draw and our auditorium size uh, um, seating capacity is limited. There is one chair up at the front that someone is kindly pointing to um, in the third row. So if you're standing, um, you may want to consider that. I want to invite you as well to visit our galleries. The galleries will open at noon, so right after this talk ends, we have an exhibition on the seventh floor called Deco from Luxury to Mass Market, which is about the development of the Art Deco style in Europe and its um, translation and adaptation in the United States. Um, so you might find that a very interesting extension of um, this morning's talk. We also have an exhibition called The Universe of Things, Mickey Wilson Collects, which is a kind of unique view of the museum's founder and his penchant for collecting um, beautiful, odd, and unusual things. Um, and you can also visit our permanent collection galleries on the fifth floor, as well as a small show on that floor about the Cuban graphic designer and illustrator in Colorado, Walter Massaguer. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to the chair of the board of the Miami Design Preservation League, Jack Johnson, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, um, and uh, welcome everyone to Art Deco Weekend. Thank you. Um, we're very proud of our partnership with the, the Wilsonian uh, Museum <coughs> on uh, our lecture series for Art Deco Weekend, and uh, you're in for a real treat uh, this morning. Um, our lecturer this morning uh, is Andrew Kapitman. Um, Andrew uh, is the son of Barbara Bayer Kapitman who was the founder of the Miami Sun Preservation League. Um, Barbara uh, and Andrew were among the first people in the world to, um, to understand and realize the importance of preserving our Art Deco heritage, our, our heritage of Art Deco architecture. Um, uh, Andrew is one of Barbara Bayer Kapitman's two sons. Uh, he was a co-founder of MDPL in 1976, a founder of Art Deco Weekend and general partner of Art Deco Hotels Limited, the first private group to acquire and restore historic district properties beginning in 1979. <coughs> Kapitman's first project, the Cardozo Hotel, uh, opened the Cafe Cardozo. Ocean Drive's first front porch restaurant in 1981, which was designed by Kapitman's wife, Margaret Ann Doyle, who is with us this morning. Um, and she also designed uh, the next Ocean Drive uh, restaurant to open the Carlisle Grill at the Carlisle Hotel. Uh, these restaurants attracted a creative and international clientele and were the first concrete visions of restored Art Deco district. Kapitman received his BA at Yale and his MA at the University of Miami School of Business and Economics. Uh, he's an investment banker and lives in New York City and uh, makes frequent trips to visit us here and we're always happy to have him. <coughs> so please welcome Andrew Kapitman. start out by saying that, that I'm a very emotional uh, person about this subject. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, 
So, the Art Deco District became a National Historic District in May 1979. Uh, by the early 1990s, it was a roaring success. Uh, Barbara passed away in uh, 1990, <coughs> and uh, pretty confident that she saw that it was becoming a huge success. Um, she could have no idea how big a success it became. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, <coughs> she didn't live to see the, the, the uh, degradation uh, of the neighborhood. Uh, and, and there's always this huge conflict between historic preservation and economic success and, and the conflicts that, that occur. Um, she also, a central tenet of Barbara's was uh, the, uh, the idea that, that South Beach, that the Art Deco District was uh, this incredible, wonderful place for old people. Uh, and um, many of her ideas and efforts were exactly aimed at preventing gentrification uh, which in the end didn't really succeed. So uh, she didn't get to see that. Um, this is this is this is like 1988 uh, in uh, town and country, uh, and th th this is really not far. Uh, but uh, she's gotten really an enormous and, and, and gratifying level of, of attention uh, and, and credit. She was always worried about credit, uh, and she got credit. Um, her memorial service was at Temple Emmanuel, which was the, the, the kind of boy for boy temple. Uh, she had opened in Time Magazine and the New York Times. Uh, she was honored by the National Trust. She's on uh, basically everybody's list of great Floridians. Um, and, and uh, you know, I personally, uh, so Mark Twain said, uh, wrote at one point when it's attributed to Mark Twain, uh, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the big promoter, the builder of the Fontainebleau had his own variation on that, which was uh, never let the truth stand in the way of a good promotion. <laughs> The, 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 the net effect of, of, of uh, focusing on Barbara is, is, is perhaps to uh, understand the role that, that uh, Marvin Doyle and I had. Okay, and uh, so this is a, an opportunity for me to tell a slightly different story. Uh, Barbara played really the central role. She was the, the conceptualizer, <coughs> the bulldog, the greeter. Uh, but essentially, the Art Deco district exists within capitalist America. And it was only going to be a success if it was an economic success. And it was only going to be preserved if it was uh, an economic success. And, and, and that's, in my mind, the, the, the contribution we made. Um, let me, uh, 
I see so many people who know this history, but, but, but uh, <clears throat> brief history of Miami Beach. Uh, the railroad doesn't come to Miami until 1895. Uh, Miami Beach is a sandbar. Uh, it's originally developed, <coughs> you call it, developed uh, with landfill to uh, to 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 be first a pineapple and then an avocado growing plantation, um, and the first wooden causeway gets built in 1913. Uh, I like this picture because because uh, th 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 this is the Vizcaya, uh, and this is one of the when I got here in the 70s. This is one of the very few pre-hurricane uh, buildings left, uh, and, and, and it's, it, it's gone. Uh, pre, of the big hotels, this, this is one of the original <coughs> big hotels in Miami Beach. Uh, the, um, the original development of Miami Beach, uh, particularly back by Carl, Carl, Carl Fisher, uh, who was the Presto Light founder, founder of the, the Speedway was really in the mode of Palm Beach and, and just down the way from Palm Beach. And, and uh, there are lots of parts of Miami Beach that still have uh, the early buildings, the mansions, uh, uh, oh, and that <coughs> special Meisner esque. Uh, Palm Beach style, uh, and uh, it, it, it was uh, an inherently and explicitly uh, anti-Semitic environment. Uh, hurricane <coughs> 1926. Uh, hurricane stopped development in Miami in 1926 and um, Miami Beach had um, this completely counter cyclical recovery and, and continued growth and right from the start post 1926 uh, there was a huge Jewish element uh, to the development uh, when you think about it they're really only I can identify it outside of Israel, only two Jewish resorts. One is the Catskills, and the other is Miami Beach. And, and actually, a lot of, uh, and, and the Catskills was also characteristically not just big hotels, it was a lot of rooming houses, and boarding houses, and little places. And the same Jewish guys who, 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 who had property there, frequently ended up with property here. And then, you know, as, as, as Jewish people spread out <laughs> across the United States, um, there's this very interesting thing that the Cleveland, was, you know, the street over on Ocean Drive, was originally built by a group of uh, Jewish businessmen from Cleveland. <laughs> that, was, that was the place. Um, and um, by 1942, the district was built, and, 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 and it was built amazingly quickly. And, and you know that there's this amazing statistic that, that, that uh, of the 800 buildings that were on the original National Register of Historic Di District, uh, 600 of them were by six architects. Uh, so you had an ecosystem of, these are very simple buildings, these are, these are you know, the bigger buildings are steel frame, but the smaller buildings are all wood frame and uh, concrete block. And the decoration is on the surface, and the ecosystem was etched glass people, concrete glass block people, uh, neon people, 
terrazzo people, concrete casting forms people, and, and these people got used over and over again. Uh, and, and some of your <coughs> the motifs that you learn about when you go on uh, an NDPL tour uh, that, 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 that you see over and over again using the same material. Um, the uh, by World War II, um, the district was what we see today uh, in the old buildings, and Miami Beach was uh, taken over by the, the, the U.S. Army um, as an officer training center. Uh, all the hotels, interesting statistics, the hotels at that point represented 25% of all the hotel rooms in Florida. Uh, and in the course of World War II, uh, in the course of World War II, 78,000 officers were trained in Miami Beach. And that was uh, an enormous contributor uh, to, uh, to broadening who knew about Miami Beach. Um, every year, from the post-world period after the war on, uh, you have new hotels open, and it, it, it kind of reaches its peak in, in, in 1954. This is the Fontainebleau, and this little business here, this is the top of the Eden Rock, built the next year. Morris's Lapidus is Fontainebleau, it was just this building, and uh, there was a very, hostile relationship between the Eden Rock owner and the Fontainebleau owner, and so they subsequently built this expansion of the, of the Fontainebleau, which had the effect of completely putting the Eden Rock pool in shape. Oh. <laughs> so, so, so it, was, uh, it was an aggressive environment, and it always was an aggressive environment. Uh, the uh, the last big hotel built is the Doral in 1961, uh, and uh, you had this this whole development of, of imagery. Uh, this is Hole in the Head, which was filmed at the Cardozo, and, and this is 1957. Frank's, Frank Frank Copra's uh, Frank Sinatra. Uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> high hopes. And uh, this is uh, this is Carolyn Jones, who's in the film, uh, and and uh, she becomes uh, Morticia in the TV atmosphere. Uh, but I'd like to like this, uh, you can see that. The, 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 Keystone, which is uh, locally mined coral rock, uh, and we, 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 we have a wash over it to make it different colors, and uh, so it's pretty distinctive. Uh, this, this, is, this, 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 this is 1960, uh, and, and um, you, you can. Recognize the, the floor of the final lobby, um, and then you know there was Jackie Gleason from Miami Beach and Arthur Godfrey from Miami Beach, uh, and and uh, really uh, you know a full frontal media arts communications of the. America's playground kind of idea. Uh, that all comes to an end, and, and Miami Beach in the 1960s become, enters into a slow decline. Uh, and there are a bunch of different reasons for that. Uh, Las Vegas with gambling. Miami Beach with no gambling. Uh, jet service. Jet planes go into service. The 707 goes into commercial service, and 
suddenly the Caribbean and all kinds of other tropical places are, are, are available. And um, Disney World opens in 1971, and that's just a further killer. And then finally, I, I put this slide back up because there ain't no beach. <laughs> and and um, there's this great scene in, in, uh, in The Heartbreak Kid, anybody that, that Charles Grew. Sybil Shepherd, yes. And, 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 and remember the storyline is, is they get married, they come to the Eden Rock, uh, they go out to the beach, and you see the scene of the beach, and there's no beach. <laughs> and, and that's when Sybil Shepherd gets sunburned, and, and the story proceeds from there. Uh, the, and um, all this time, South Beach is uh, still there, and, and, and this, is, this is the cover of Andy Sweet's book. And Andy Sweet was a photographer um, working right when, when, when we were there, and if you haven't seen this book, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a great bunch of pictures of old Jewish people on Miami Beach and, and, and the nice lives they had. Uh, and you had this development, these two characters. <laughs> so first Simon Wickler and then Revy Wickler, the Miami Beach City Commissioners. And he was a podiatrist. And she ran a little newspaper, which was really a political promotional vehicle. And, um, and, and, and I put them up because it, it speaks to the, the coherent society that existed there. Um, but the problem was that the, 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 the society was, was uh, an old people. When we bought the Cardozo in 1979, the average age of our guests was 80 years old. So, uh, and, and uh, right at the same period, uh, there is this development of this thing called Century City up in, in, in Broward County. A huge development. In four years, it had 15,000 people resident. Uh, it was promoted by, by a character named Red Buttons. And, and, and um, you know, Miami Beach had this culture and, and this population, but they were dying. And so when you got to where we began in the mid-70s, uh, it was really quiet. Uh, you could get a parking place on the street <laughs> any time, any day, any hour, any day of the year. Uh, and and uh, the beach, first of all, was a much smaller beach. It was very, it was very pleasant. Out of the hotel and walk to the beach and didn't have to go across the huge desert of the big beach now. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, but it was it was really sleeping. And uh, that's when Barbara comes into the picture. So I wanted to tell you about Barbara. Um, this is um, this is is Marca, Mar Marcus and Bertha Weil. Uh, Marcus came to the United States in 1948. He was one of five brothers. Uh, they, uh, uh, and, and, and Marcus was <coughs> Barbara's great-grandfather, Myrtle Bear, and Mar uh, Barbara's mother's uh, grandmother, grandparents. Uh, and they settled in Ann Arbor and then moved to Chicago. They had a leather tanning business. Uh, and uh, the leather tanning business was on, on an island in the, in the <coughs> river, and uh, consequently during the Chicago fire, it was not burned down, and uh, they did very well. Uh, this is Myrtle, Barbara's mother, uh, and, and uh, she uh, studied at the Art Institute in Chicago, she and her husband Herschel Bear moved to 
uh, in New York in about 1924, uh, and she, uh, I don't have any proof of this, but the way my mother told me was that she studied with our show Gorky at the Art Students League. And uh, she was quite good and, and, and had a very clear impact as an artist that this is me. <laughs> Brother, this is me again. Uh -huh. uh, and, and then she got into uh, uh -huh. which, what she called American Staffordshire. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, of course, there, there's the of Barbara, and, and, and uh, that's the the bus that, that, that we use to uh, create the Barbara Gare Catholic Memorial. Uh, this is uh, Barbara and Myrtle on the SS Bremen in 1929 going to Europe. And uh, this is Barbara's high school picture. Uh, so she went to Julia Richmond High School and uh, her Pat Highsmith, Patricia Highsmith, was in her class, and a year behind her, her best friend was a woman <clears throat> then known as Judy, Judy Tuvim, who became Judy Holliday. And uh, Barbara was a lefty from day one, <laughs> and um, through Judy Holliday, uh, she got to know Betty Comden and Adolph Green and <coughs> Bernstein. And uh, all, the, all the people who had a hard time during the McCarthy era. Uh, and uh, um, the memorial says writer, artist, preservationist. And uh, this is a self-portrait, my part. This is Bill, her husband, uh, toward the end of the war. And Barbara and Bill got married in 1948. Uh, and uh, Bill was uh, the National Veterans Coordinator for the Henry Wallace campaign in 1948. Uh, so again, he, he was as far left as Barbara. <laughs> uh, so Bill's story was, was, was um, passed the bar in 1951 and got failed by the character committee of the New York State Park. Uh, and, and so uh, he couldn't be a lawyer. And uh, he ended up, Barbara and Bill very much together, started this business called the Center for Research and Marketing. And uh, they, this was the early days of marketing research, and um, they did primarily packaging design. And the packaging design work all came from uh, Barbara's relationship with industrial designers because her first work in the, in the 1940s was working for magazine, trade magazines like Modern Lighting and Lamps and Modern Plastics. So she ended up doing public relations work for Donald Desky and Lippincott and Margulies and Frank Joni Noto and, and Saul Bass. Uh, and and uh, so they were able to get these large corporations to hire them to test packaging design uh, and, and uh, a lot of other related marketing research things. So Barbara had this extraordinary background of journalism, an artsy mother, um, and, and uh, this really uh, keen understanding of, of, of marketing and public relations. Yep. This is Bill when he grows up. Thank um, you. 
and uh, this is Barbara and Bill on their boat, sea legs. Uh, they did pretty well, and they had a very nice life. Uh, along the way, uh, Barbara did this book, History of American Trademark Designs. Uh, as again, the, the, the whole point is she's very embedded and knowledgeable uh, about marketing, public relations, industrial design. That's her real background for doing this. Uh, this is, this is uh, Barbara and Bill in the, in, in the Bahamas, uh, in really just about eight months before Bill dies. So, um, Bill, 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 they sold the business. I don't think they made much money out of selling the business. I know they didn't. And uh, Bill embarked you know, in his late 40s on a second career of, of, of being an academician. And they ended up moving down to Miami uh, in 1973. And Bill was uh, one of the first tenured professors at the FIU Business School. And then he up and dies. Uh, and uh, the scattered Bill's ashes on Martha's Vineyard. And um, we had this very clear idea that, that Barbara should do something uh, worthwhile. And we were committed to that. And when Bill died, there, there was, you know, Bill's estate was $40,000. And uh, so there was a little bit of work left from, from he had a consulting, ongoing consulting business. And we were doing a study on uh, attitudes towards uh, water filters. The company was Brita Water Filters. And so when Bill died in the, in, the, in, the, in the summer of 75, we needed to get the money for finishing the study. And uh, the, the way we, we did our research was uh, we, we would do group interviews. And so where it was a good place to get a group, good group of elderly people, it was in one of the, one of the temple's daycare centers on South Beach. And, and my story, and everybody's got their own story, but my story is that uh, we kept on going to South Beach to do these interviews, and uh, Barbara was walking around, and she said, I think this is Art Deco. Now, Art Deco was a very new term at that point, right? Victor Air was kind of uh, the first real book calling it Art Deco. It's only 1967. So it's, it's not very long after that. Um, and um, <clears throat> so she got it in her idea, in her mind, uh, to, to do her project. And her project was going to be saving the Art Deco. Um, rather than go through a kind of blow by blow of, of what happened between December 1, 1976, when, when I chaired the first big meeting of Miami Design Preservation League uh, in, in, in the design district. Um, what I'd really like to focus on is what do I think are the things that made it work? Uh, the first thing that made it work uh, was legitimacy. Uh, once you got people who knew this kind of stuff to look at it, there was kind of no question that it was a, a, an absolutely globally unique neighborhood in terms of its concentration, in terms of the vibrancy of the designs, in terms of the kind of interpretation of, of Deco in a southern <clears throat> tropical context. And, and so very early on, this is 1978, um, 
and, 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 and it's on the cover of American Preservation, and it's on the cover of Progressive Architecture. Uh, and, and Barbara was an incredible publicist, but, but you don't get publicity for bullshit. It, it, it's my basic, you know, there has to be a kernel of truth. And, and the kernel of truth wow. was, was a whole year. Um, the second thing was um, that this was, this, this whole project was consistent with the ambitions of the Carter administration. And, and, and Arbor got, and they mined and designed preservation league, very, very quickly got government support. Arbor, <coughs> great grantsmanship skills, and, and, and we all knew how to write. And, and there were lots of opportunities. And um, if, if you think about it, the, the usual context of urban center city projects is, is, is uh, disadvantaged people of color trying to do these things. Um, when you've got a group of, of, of highly educated, literate people uh, with a political orientation pursuing these things, uh, you get support. And so the NEA, HUD at the time, uh, all were, were, were uh, quite willing to, to give us money. And so, and, and, and this is, uh, this is the, one of the early offices of MDP. Um, this, is, this is Barbara with uh, a man named James Morrison Fitch. And Fitch is, is really considered the godfather of the American Historic Preservation Movement. He was uh, the first dean of, of, of uh, the Columbia University uh, graduate program in historic preservation, which was the first historic preservation graduate program in the country. And this is during uh, the, 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 the competition to be hired to do, as, a, as an architecture firm to do the historic district plan in, 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 in uh, 1977. And uh, Fitch is there with a, a really terrific firm called Bayer Blender Bell. Uh, which has done many of the most important big restorations in the United States. But Fitch says, well, I, I don't particularly care for Art Deco. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so they don't win. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, a, a Boston firm called Anderson Nodder Feingold wins the, does, does the historic district plan. So, um, then Barbara and, and, and we had, had enormous, because of Barbara's background, enormous publishing, writing capabilities. And this was the first, this is Portfolio Magazine, which was really uh, the first picture book uh, of the Art Deco District, uh, funded by an NEA grant. So uh, you, and then the, the, the final thing was Barbara, as, as a smart publicist, really understood visual imagery. And, and uh, this is the first poster by uh, a chap named Woody Van Dusen, uh, who was uh, an Eastern Airlines mechanic. Uh, from Michigan who, who showed up at an MDPL meeting and said, can I do some posters for you? And this was his first poster. Uh, this is the Plymouth Hotel. Uh, the Plymouth Hotel is now the dormitory for the New World Symphony. And not anymore? Okay, sorry, it was. And, and, uh, the imagery was, was tremendously important and uh, Andy Fabregas, who was a wonderful architect and, 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 and an early chairman of MDPL, uh, did the logo that you see uh, all over the place, like, like like in the program. It's too small to see, but if you have the program, 
that, that's Andy Fabregas' original design. But Barbara and, 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 and I encouraged artists and encouraged uh, as much consistent visual imagery as we could, and, and we think that had a clear impact. Um, so this is really where I come in. Um, this, this, this aerial view, what I think is important about this aerial view is uh, you see all the little lots and you see the, 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 the urban grid. Um, if you want to play Monopoly, this is just like everything's my size. Uh, you know, and, and, and so at the outset, each one of these little lots or the building that was on it was very affordable. We bought the Cardozo Hotel in 1979 for $800,000 for 70 rooms. Uh, when uh, Gloria Estefan and, and Emilio Estefan bought it in 1992, they paid $5.3 million for it. Um, so we were, we were paying like, like, like $8,000 a hotel room. Uh, and hotel rooms in Miami Beach in the Art Deco District on Ocean Drive on Collins Avenue now traded around 250,000. So, uh, but that's, that's what monopoly is about. Um, I really came to the view that, that, that I had to stop being a banker and uh, get involved you know, full time in, in, in the Art Deco district. At, Art Deco Week in, in September, October, um, 1978. And uh, the high point of, of this first week-long effort, uh, Art Deco Week, uh, was uh, the first Moon Over Miami Bowl at the Edwards Hotel, uh, RIP. But, uh, went up to the roof and, and, and it was a lovely January night, a lovely October night, and, and it just felt very doable. So um, it, 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 it was three years after my father died. Um, I had been making money, and um, so we still had $50,000. And um, we, made a deal by December of 78 to buy the Cardozo for 800,000, as I said, $160,000 down. I put down a $10,000 deposit for a three month option. And I could get two more 40 day periods or 30 day periods for, for, for another $10,000 a shot. And, um, Raising the money was very, very difficult. Uh, and and uh, a number of people who, 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 who were important to the story uh, it, were willing to invest. At the end of the day, <laughs> I came out owning a very, about, about a quarter of what's a typical carried interest for a promoter uh, in the Cardozo. And I, but I, I did get all the money. Um, I had seven hundred dollars left, <laughs> and, and, and that was the card. It was a, and uh, the, the the day I bought the card was a, it's not the day I met Margaret Doyle, uh, who my mother had met first. <laughs> And, and Margaret was a graduate of the St. Chap Fitch's uh, Historic Preservation Program in Columbia and was working for the, uh, uh, as a technical preservation services officer uh, for the Heritage Conservation Recreation Service Department of Interior. And um, Barbara, this, this was one of the agencies that Barbara had a good relationship with and Margaret was sent down to lecture June 25th, 1979, a month after it became a National Historic District uh, and, and stayed at the Cardozo. So 
So I met Carter and Margaret sitting on the porch of the Cardozo in absolute shell shock that I had <coughs> done this thing of, 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 of buying this hotel. Um, and um, it became a national historic day, and, and, and we, we, we used Woody as well and, and, and gave Woody assignment after assignment. Um, when I was out marketing um, the, um, when I was out marketing, the, 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 everybody I pitched for investing got a, got a poster. And then we had a second poster also by Woody. And the fact that it, become, it had become a National Historic District really afforded no protection to the district. This was the New Yorker, which is an absolutely fabulous Henry Hohauser Hotel. Uh, it was going to be torn down. Uh, this is Margaret out picketing, uh, but the New Yorker comes down anyway. And um, the guy who owned it um, gets quoted nationally. It's my hotel. I have the right to tear it down. If I owned the Mona Lisa, wouldn't it be my right to destroy it? And it kind of backfires because by then there, 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 there's enough imagery created that you know you get a vodka ad of the New Yorker. Uh, the second hotel we bought with was the Victor, and. Um, this is, this is 1981, and we had, uh, we, we were now having the second moon over Miami Hall, and uh, in December 81, and, I'm sorry, December 81, and it was a huge rush to get it done. Again, using Woody, this was my prospectus out raising money for the Victor. And this was the Victor poster, and, uh, this was this was uh, the lobby of the Victor uh, pre-restoration and uh, multiple layers of carpet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this this was the finished product in time for the moon over Miami Ball. Uh, this is by, or this mural is by Earl Le Pen. His works all over the district. You have details like that. And all the lighting fixtures were still there, painted with bronze paint, uh, but every single petal of glass in those fanciful fixtures was still there. And um, Michael Knurk and Dennis Wilhelm, who were stalwarts of, of, of the Art Deco movement, uh, were, 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 uh, did the restoration of, of these lighting fixtures. So this, uh, th this was a real, this was the first real game changer. I'm always struck by the fact that, that, that uh, we were into this whole idea of really doing historic preservation. Um, it's a very different aesthetic than has come to pass. But it was consistent with what we were saying and consistent with the ideas of, of what constitutes compliance with uh, the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines uh, for historic preservation. Our next, uh, so, so this is uh, Diane Camber, Barbara, and Leonard Horowitz at the uh, Moon Over Miami Bowl. Uh, and that's me and Margaret. Yes. <laughs> Life is tough, huh? <laughs> uh, and, 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 and so we, 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 we just got wonderful, 
wonderful publicity, and we didn't have any money for advertising, um, but we did like and know how to talk to journalists, and um, we liked journalists. So this, is, this was uh, really the beginning of, of, of what becomes Ocean Drive, and this is, uh, this is Margaret's Cafe Cardozo. And there was, a, there was a law, among many laws, passed on Miami Beach to favor the big hotels and hurt the little hotels that said you couldn't have a signage from a restaurant. First of all, you had to have 100 rooms, and second of all, you had to have no exterior signage. Uh, and so our answer was to put a big uh, neon sign, uh, the graphic designed by Woody Andresik again, and, and this is the cargoes on the inside and on the outside, and all of a sudden we opened the car to Cafe Cardoza, and it, it was an immediate success. And uh, lots of young people, when we first got there, there were no young people. You, you know, if you saw somebody in a bikini going to the beach, uh, everybody ran to the window. <laughs> and, 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 and as a portent of the future. <coughs> uh, and uh, this is a, a, a postcard by, by uh, one of the local artists, Fred Albert. Uh, and this is what, <coughs> this is what really gave people the idea that, 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 that this could be a big success. And, and that, that this was enormous and people flocked there from all over Miami. Um, and then in, 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 in 1980, sorry, 1982, we turned, we hadn't had another Art Deco week. We, we turned it into Art Deco weekend and this was the breakout year of uh, when, when uh, we had three blocks of booze and three bandstands and the lecture series and most of what you experience today, much smaller, but, but same, same idea. And, and um, what we were able to do was after we bought the Victor, we hired a tremendous travel publicist uh, PR guy named Al Wolf, and he said, uh, you know, if you get it ready, I'll get 30 travel writers to come down for our Deco weekend. And uh, they did, and, and, and the publicity <coughs> barrage continued. Uh, the next big restoration, the, really the first complete restoration, uh, was the Carlisle, right next door to the Cardoz. And uh, this was the Carlisle Grill. Uh, Carlisle Grill was our first liquor license, and, and, and that was a big success. And these were rooms in the Cardozo, uh, very modest, but this is all, this is all Conan Ball, original case goods from the period. Every room had posters, every room had hand-colored photos. Uh, when we got to the, the, the Carlisle, uh, we had much more money to spend uh, and, 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 and got fancier. Um, summer, uh, w winter of, of 1983 uh, was Surrounded Islands by Krista. And we had this wonderful thing. By that point, we, we had seven hotels on, on Ocean Drive. And Christo took every room in the hotels for, for two months to, for, for his crew to do Surrounded Islands. And this was this totally international, hip crowd. Uh, and and it, was, it, it was a great global introduction. Um, and, and, and so the publicity continued, and, and, and the travel stories continued, and it all follows from there. Um, in 1980, in, in 1984, 
Um, we, with our seven properties, were appro approached by a public company uh, controlled by a bunch of basically mob guys. Um, and uh, the one, the one thing that I couldn't control was that if I got an offer for the hotels, the limited partners had the right to vote on it. And uh, the limited partners at that point, you gotta remember, this was, this was a time with a 70% tax bracket. But there were enormous loopholes. And uh, so properties like ours with restoration going on got enormous tax benefits. So most of my partners, who, who limited partners who were by definition wealthy people, um, were basically out of the deal on an after-tax basis, if you know what I mean. You, get, you may invest a certain amount of money, but if you get a two-for-one tax write-off and you're in the 70% tax bracket, you've actually gotten your money back plus in terms of tax savings. So this was that the offer was to convert their limited partnership interests into stock in a public company, which was liquid, and they voted overwhelmingly to take the deal. Uh, and and um, so then I had to decide whether I was going to stay in Miami Beach or go back to being a banker. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's Yogi Berra. Uh, who says, okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I took it. So I took it. So Barbara, Barbara went on to uh, to 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 uh, th this is this is her book on the Art Deco district. Uh, she then, for the Miami News, started traveling around the country, uh, starting in the summer of '83, and uh, writing a series on Art Deco in the United States and uh, was central in the formation of Art Deco societies uh, all over uh, New York, Tulsa, <coughs> Chicago, Boston, Washington, San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Johannesburg, and London, of course, and, and so on. And uh, <coughs> this book, which was uh, she signed the contract for this book uh, two weeks before she died, and it was finished and really put together by Dennis Knurk and Michael Wilhelm, and, and, and that's her legacy. Um, everything else comes after that. Uh, Tony Goldman was a, a much better businessman than me. Uh, Mark Soika opened the News Cafe. The movies that I had seen being filmed, like Scarface on Ocean Drive with Al Pacino driving around in Car Carlisle, come out. And then 1984, uh, Miami Vice starts. And Miami Vice was a huge impact. And, and if you look at the beginning of Miami Vice, there's this one flash of uh, two women in bikinis walking onto the Carlisle steps. Very, very, very uh, so that's what I've got, uh, and, and thank you all very much. <laughs>